Right, good evening everyone. Thank you for taking the time to come and hear us. Um, this evening's webinar, I'm gonna talk a little bit about 2023, a little bit about 2022, and um, a little bit about uh, investing through a recession. Um, I hope to keep it under 45 minutes and I hope that the next 30 to 45 minutes adds value in your life. The, um, We've been hosting uh, webinars like this since Corona, and as long as people keep registering, we'll, we're happy to keep hosting them. I think I see in this particular webinar more people registered than any other previous one, and I suspect that has more to do with um, the state of portfolios rather than uh, my uh, presentation skills. But I hope to um, uh, share with you some information which will be of value. Um, my focus is on global markets. My colleague Shmuel Ben-Ari hosted a webinar yesterday in Hebrew with a little bit more focus on the local market. So if you understand Hebrew, you're very welcome to go to our website and, and watch that. Okay, so let's move into oops, where is my screen. There we go. Okay, so um, this graph uh, was published in the Financial Times. It's from uh, Schiller Research House. Um, and I found it very powerful for a number of reasons. Let me just explain what you're looking at. Each dot here is a calendar year returns, right? From 1871 to 2022. So you've got 150 years worth of uh, performance here. The x-axis, the horizontal is US stocks. The vertical axis is US bonds. And we can see very clearly the distribution of returns over the last 150 years. Now, there's two very important messages uh, for me about this graph. Firstly, you can see where two, 2022 is, way down in the uh, negative quadrant, um, standing all by itself, far from anywhere else. And it's very clear that it's the worst year ever in the history of the bond market. It's um, we had rapidly rising interest rates off a very low base. I will talk about that a bit more later on, but the result is that bonds were severely hurt and we haven't seen that ever before. Um, another important point is how few years there are in the bottom quadrant, the bottom left quadrant where you lose on both stocks and bonds is three, except 1987, three, maybe four years out of 150. So very, very, very exceptional uh, returns in 2022. That's the, that's the one uh, message. On a more positive note, if you look at the distribution of returns, okay, so the horizontal gray line, everything above that is a positive year for bonds. And the vertical gray line, everything to the right of that is a positive year for stocks. So you can first see how many years we've got both positive stocks and positive bonds but if you look at the horizontal line and you above that you see that a significant percentage of the bond returns are positive we're not used to in the wealth management or asset management industry we're not used to really losing money on bonds most of the time bonds are pretty stable you collect your coupon and you make money. And that is very, very visible in this uh, graphical presentation. Most of the time, bonds are doing their job. And then on the um, equity side, you can see there's some negative years, some positive years, but we often um, make money on bonds in, in years when the stocks are negative, we often make money on bonds, which help reduce the loss. Now, the important message here for me is that this is what gives advisors and asset managers like myself the confidence to sit opposite clients and help them to manage their money, okay? It's all about the distribution of these returns. We do not guarantee that you will make money, but we have a particular strategy that relies on the fact that most of the time, capital markets work in your favor. Not all the time, but uh, most of the time. Sometimes we hear from clients that they expect us to switch between stocks and bonds based on our particular view. No, that's not how asset management works, right? The bond component 
is there because bonds are supposedly or most of the time more predictable and at least they have a, a, a more predictable flaw. And therefore, if a client is conservative and can't take risk, they're going to have more bonds in their portfolio. That is the professional advice. That is what's accepted by uh, our regulators and, uh, and by the test of time. So most of the time, conservative investor being in bonds is the right place to be. And any, the point I want to make of this distribution is how exceptional 2022 was and how we get our confidence to sit opposite clients and, and give advice. Okay, 2022 snapshot. This slide has hardly changed over my last few presentations. Um, the Ukraine war and the resulting weaponization of commodity prices um, pushed inflation to levels unseen in a very long time. And most importantly, and what I'll speak more about now, is the central bank intervention. So interest rates went up from uh, one to one and a half percent to around four percent, contrary to all expectations, including the Federal Reserve's own predictions. The Federal Reserve is not just Powell, it's not just one guy. He's the chairman of a 19 person committee, I believe. And each of these people give their personal prediction about the path of interest rates in what's called the dot plot. And this is published. You can just Google dot plot and you can go see it. And you can Google, Google dot plot December 2021. And you'll see that most of this own committee, none of them predicted where interest rates were going to be. And this is the Federal Reserve who sets interest rates. So the Federal Reserve lost a lot of credibility with market participants like ourselves. Um, and we, we normally rely on this to get some sense of where interest rates are going, and they got it hopelessly wrong. So the following rapid increase in interest rates, a recession of some sort was expected. Uh, we're going to talk about that in a second. And the forward-looking stock market started to sell off in anticipation of lower corporate profits. Human nature is such that it tends to overshoot, and uh, we often see stock market go down more than is warranted, and that gives us a, a source of optimism. In terms of benchmark portfolios, a benchmark balanced portfolio in dollars, okay, sorry, the, the word dollars is missing from my slide, is approximately minus 16%. The more aggressive you are as a, in your mandate, the more equities you have, your benchmark is closer to minus 20. The more conservative you are and the more bonds you have in your dollar portfolio, the closer your benchmark is to minus 15. So if your asset manager did better than those numbers, then they added some value for you in 2022. The shekel portfolio um, is, is better. Shekel portfolios did better on a whole. And a benchmark for a balanced shekel portfolio is approximately minus 10. And I'll show you how we get these numbers now. These are the main indices, okay? This is the pool that we swim in. This is the capital markets that we operate in. And uh, if you're in liquid investments, then this is what's happened. I'd like you to focus on the two right-hand columns. The one is the year result of 2000 and, um, 2022, and the other is the last six months. Now, in the equity side, We've done absolutely fine. Even taking into account 2022, you've still done extremely well on uh, in your equity allocation, particularly US equity allocations, over the last three years. You, you don't realistically expect more than 25% for three years. If you get it, great. But um, it's a very we're very happy with our, our result, even after taking into account 2022. NASDAQ is up 28% over the last three years. Yes, down 33%. Any client who joined during those three years or at the end of 2021 and didn't enjoy these very good returns before is obviously going to feel it more than a client who's been around a bit longer. Um, global equities at minus 17. Uh, for a long time, we saw the US market constantly doing better than the global market. Here we see the US market doing slightly worse in the global market. Um, not a huge difference, but it's still interesting to see. Tel Aviv stock exchange minus 13, a hell of a lot better than um, the global market. But if you look at the long-term number, you can see that Tel Aviv 
uh, shares have not produced uh, nearly the high returns that the USA and uh, Israel much more closely resembles global shares than USA shares. More importantly to, that for me is the issue of bonds. Okay, getting back to bonds, most clients, especially in a wealth management uh, environment, most clients have more money in bonds than, than stocks. And this index return here, we've got minus 15.64, whoops, sorry. We got minus 15.64 for the um, bark, it's uh, the aggregate bond index. And the three year result is minus 12, which is unbelievable. It, it's really, really unbelievable. Now, anyone who's attended our uh, webinars in the past uh, through 2021 and 2020, I articulated how difficult it was to make money with bonds. We had this lopsided risk return profile. We said on the upside, we're going to get one or two percent. And on the downside, we could lose 10 to 15. And this, we didn't even think it could get as bad as this. So we had this lopsided problem, but we still had to allocate to bonds in terms of our risk management mandates. So a, anyone who has been in bonds is likely to be disappointed with their long-term returns. What's the good news here? The good news is going forward, bonds should be able to give much better returns than they have over the last 10 years. So bonds are back is one of the takeaway messages from this webinar, okay? And we shouldn't have the same challenges that we had um, of earning very little and risking uh, quite a lot. Similar on treasury bonds and Israeli corporate bonds, also a similar story. Three years, if you held the Tel Bond 60 index, you're, um, you're at minus 1.8% before any fees of the instrument that gave you access to that index. Hedge funds are, are not much to talk about in general, although there were some good hedge funds that produced positive returns in, um, in uh, 2022. Some of those are in our hedge fund portfolio, so we're very happy with that. But um, uh, hedge funds overall are disappointed. But the, the main takeaway message, and this is the source of frustration of many client investors, that bonds over the last three years is just simply not added value. But going forward, it's a different story. Okay, so in uh, when you register for this uh, webinar, you get a, a prompt that says, do you have any questions? And, what, and the most common question we got is, is around this issue of when will my investments recover? When will sentiment turn positive? When, etc. So a similar question. So I decided to dedicate a slide to this question. Um, when you look at your 2022 return, it's useful to split it into a bond component and a stock component, which is pretty much along the asset allocation lines. Because the losses were so similar in stocks and bonds, you can roughly split your number between your asset allocation. So if your asset allocation is 60-40, uh, then you simply take 60-40 of your return. On the stock side, on the equity side, it's harder to predict the short, it's always difficult to predict the uh, um, stocks in the short term, um, but we need to get some faith from the historical data. The historical data on stocks is overwhelmingly in favor that the longer you're in the stock market, and I mean broad access to the stock market, not single stock name. It's not like you have one company or a, or a concentration around Apple, Facebook, et cetera. If you have broad market exposure, the evidence is overwhelmingly in favor that in time you will make money, okay? How does this work? What's behind this? We know that the part of the growth is linked to economic growth over time. We know that part of the growth is linked to the dividends that these companies pay over time. We know that part of the growth is an inflation linkage. As, as inflation happens, low levels of inflation or normal levels of inflation, uh, companies increase the prices of their goods and that translates to more profit, and that translates to to growth in the uh, in your in your stock component. So that gives us long term comfort that your stock component will recover. The other day, I heard a presentation by one of the probably the the uh, investment strategist in charge of the most money in Israel, and um, he started his presentation to say very simply, 
the evidence is overwhelmingly in favor that a positive year follows a negative year. <laughs> you know, we all laugh. Like, you expect such a, you expect a fancy macro uh, economic presentation from a guy like that. And he said very simply, nine times out of 10, a positive year follows a negative year. So what are we worried about on stocks? Anyway, it's a very simplistic thing, but there is. <laughs> so let's hope that that's a source of, um, of comfort. And let's hope that that simplistic view happens. On the bond side, which bonds, which is, are more reliable generally, okay, not perfectly predictable, but more reliable to predict. On the bond side, we expect to make those recoveries. We, you know, we've got a high level of confidence towards those recoveries in the short term. And I'll demonstrate that with by going into a detailed example on a particular bond in a minute, all right? So as long as interest rates reasonably stabilize, okay? Not going, not the spike that we had in 2022, uh, which was exceptional. And we don't think that's gonna be repeated. And most uh, professionals don't think that's gonna be repeated. So we will collect our coupon and bonds, and then slowly as we approach maturity in the bond, the bond will recover. Okay, this is the uh, long-term equity. The white line is the S&P 500. The blue line is the S&P 500 with dividends reinvested. So you've, those of you who've been on my um, webinars before, I often present this. You can see the power of compounding that dividend. And you can see the, uh, the crises or recessions that we've been through in the past. This is from 1995. Um, and... Um, I uh, just randomly chose an old date. The, um, uh, we could see the dot-com bubble, the 2008 financial crisis, COVID, and there's a whole lot of other crises that we've been through in the past, which look like, they not even look like crises when you look at a, a long-term graph like this. So this should be part of that source of comfort that your stocks will recover. Um, yesterday evening, I listened to a um, Goldman Sachs presentation for professionals. And um, on the issue of a recession, will there be a recession? Won't there be a recession? And they, they spent a lot of time uh, uh, discussing and going into it. They presented this slide, which these names here uh, won't mean much to, to you, but these are some of the most highest paid economic people around. And there's the Goldman Sachs have got their own investment group that has some sort of uh, consensus view. And what you can see is that in one year, this is the probability of a recession. So we've got anything from 35% to 70% in one year. And then in two years, we have higher numbers, okay? So what are the takeaways from this? Number one, a recession, is, and they're talking about the United States, okay? Um, a recession is not obvious. It's not like we're in a recession or we're gonna have a recession. I think that we will have some sort of recession, but this, the fact that these experts, and they are experts, don't agree, and they're not saying 100%, that should be a source of comfort that even if they're wrong, even if there is a formal recession, it won't be so bad, right? If they're not even in an agreement that there will or there won't be a recession, then at least we got some comfort that it won't be so bad. There's a nice quote at the bottom from Jer uh, Jerome Powell, who is chairman of the Federal Reserve. He says, I don't think anyone knows whether we're going to have a recession or not. It's just not knowable. And I think that, that <laughs> this is the guy who's sitting, he's holding all the cards and he can create a recession or not. And he's saying, you can't predict a recession. So we shouldn't spend too much time uh, on trying to intellectualize, will there be a recession or won't there be a recession? Um, I think we should just focus on our portfolios and say, okay, well, if there is a recession or if there isn't, what, what can we do about it, all right? So I would like to say, let's assume that there is gonna be a recession and there will be some sort of slowdown, okay? Let's assume that. And how does that affect our portfolio and what are we gonna do about it, all right? The, again, I'd like to repeat that the, the doubt across the board from these experts makes it unlikely that we're gonna have a severe recession. The US government is still spending money on climate change, on infrastructure, on other things, on social uh, things. They're still spending lots of money. They haven't cut back too much there. Um, companies have money and 
consumers still have money. The American consumer is wealthy, not across the board. Obviously, there's people uh, who are not wealthy who would be most vulnerable in a recession, but your average American does have money. Okay, and that makes the US economy and the US consumer a little bit more robust. Let's just have a look at this concept of recessions and what does it mean if there is a recession? So here is all the recessions, or at least the ones where there's an agreement amongst the economists as to when there is a recession. The definition of recession is slightly contentious, but at least here we can see that um, there formally there was a recession declared. One of them is COVID 2020, and it only lasted two months. So I think let's ignore that one. We've got the 1970s oil crisis, early 1980s, which is the consequences of tackling inflation, which is arguably the most relevant now. Um, and we've got 1990s cyclical, we've got 2001 following the dot-com bubble, following 9-11, and we've got the financial crisis, post-financial crisis, 2007-2009, uh, okay? Look at the length of time of the recession. These are not very long periods of time. These are months, okay? Months or one year about. So that also gives you some comfort. From an investment point of view, we're all investing for longer than whatever's going to happen in the next year or so. The peak unemployment rate is very important. If this is the major damage of a recession, okay, and you can look across the top six lines there, Let's say that 9% peak unemployment is the average for a, a recession. Um, in order to get to 9%, currently the unemployment in the United States is 3.7%. To go from 37 to say 9, 8 million people have to lose their jobs. 8 million people, okay? None of us here can see that happening. Okay, we, we, it's just a huge, huge, huge number. Yes, there'll be some layoffs. Yes, there'll be some uh, companies closing down. There will, there will be pain, all right? But 8 million people losing their jobs, I'm not sure that's going to happen. So that should give us another level of comfort that the um, recession will not be as deep as some people fear. Okay, I think it's very important that we review bonds a little bit. So forgive me for uh, the more sophisticated investors that are listening to this call. Just hear me out. I'm going to go over some bond mathematics and I'm going to show you two real examples and how, uh, and it, it's kind of interesting. So just bear with me. All right. So bonds, what is a bond? A bond is a series of cash flows, right? Where you get your coupon, your coupon, your coupon, and then it matures at some point in time. Whilst you own that bond, the price will change based on demand and supply, okay? The value of that bond is a pure mathematical um, present value of those future cash flows. So you've got coupon, coupon, coupon maturity, discount that back at some interest rate, and you've got the value of that bond now. Then that the price will change from that value based on demand and supply. Um, if interest rates go up, then mathematically the value goes down. The longer the bond, the more sensitive it is to changes in interest rates and the less predictable it is. The short bond is much more predictable and a long bond is less predictable. The price of a bond is expressed as yield to maturity, okay, which is how much you will earn if you buy that bond today and you hold it to maturity. So, for example, very simply, if a new bond issued at 100 issues a, has a coupon of five and it has a five-year maturity and you hold it for five years, you will earn five. If you buy it at a discount, you'll earn something higher than five. If you buy it at a premium, you'll earn something lower than five. Okay, But the yield to maturity is how we express the price of a bond. There are three main risks to a bond. Default risk that the company goes bust. Interest rate sensitivity, I explained. Uh, and liquidity. People seldom appreciate that the bond market is not as liquid as one thinks. And uh, especially in a crisis when people, everyone wants to sell at once, um, you can have a big uh, spread in the price based purely on demand and supply. I'm going to show you now two examples, okay? Both are JP Morgan bonds. 
JP Morgan is the largest bank in the United States. It's the largest bank in the world outside of China. I think it's the fifth largest bank in the world by assets. And the four banks bigger are all in China, just by the way. Um, and um, uh, the two bonds have a very similar coupon. I couldn't find two with the exact coupon. The one is 4.15 and the one is four. So we have the same issuer, the same type of bond, because there are more sophisticated bonds. So we've got a, two plain vanilla bonds, right, from the same issuer with similar coupons. The only difference is one is short and one is long. And why is that? Why am I doing this? Because this explains both, both the losses in 2022 and why we think we're going to hold this bond through whatever recession is thrown at us. Okay. So here you see a Bloomberg screen. The line is the price of the bond over the period of 2022. And just looking at the graph, it looks like that fell. But if you look at the scale on the right hand side, which may not be clear on some of your screens, but um, the price, I wrote it on the left hand side, the price fell from approximately 100 to 98 point something. So we had a market loss of less than 2% on the short dated bond. Okay, now let's look at the long dated bond. Okay, the long dated bond is JP Morgan 4% 2037. The graph looks similar to the short bond. You can see it very similar, okay? But the price on this bond, right, went from 101 or 102 down to 75. It had a mark-to-market -market loss of 16%, okay, which is enormous for the, for the, for the type of uh, investor who would hold this simple, simple bond, okay? But what is the good news? All okay. right, the good news is that going forward on this bond, right, on the short bond, on the short bond going forward, remember I said price, there's two ways to define price in a bond. It's what you're going to earn if you buy it today or if you hold it today. And, uh, and then there's the par value price. So if you bought the short dated bond, JP Morgan, whoops, if you bought the short dated bond, the 2024 bond last year, you would have earned 0.7% till that maturity in 2024. Now, this is what I was saying about how difficult it is to make money on using conservative instruments like traditional bonds. Now you buy the same bond, you're going to get 5%. This identical bond, you buy it now, as opposed to a year ago, uh, you're going to get 5%. If you buy the longer bond, a year ago, you would have earned 3.3% per year till 2037. Now you're going to earn 57 So you have to ask yourself, is that extra 0.7, is it worth it for the volatility that I'm going to have along the way? That's for each person to decide. For me and for, for the clients that I'm managing, I don't think that it's worth it. So I'm very happy to buy the 5% bond. And we're going to earn 5% no matter what. JP Morgan will survive whatever recession is coming, whether it's terrible or whether it's uh, mild, JP Morgan will be there. Um, they have deep, it's a, it, it, regulation has changed since 2008 and large banks like this are not gonna fail. At least I can say that with reasonable confidence, okay? So what does this mean? Bonds are back. We can buy conservative instruments, earn reasonable returns, from now on without taking too long a duration risk, okay? Um, it's very easy to see this when you own a direct bond, okay? In many uh, client portfolios, we've been buying uh, ETFs and funds where it's less obvious, okay? It's less obvious to see, but the same mechanics are happening inside that instrument. Now, the dilemma. So clients in Israel, clients are using Israeli banks. Israeli banks are offering very, very aggressive and very high rates on dollar fixed deposits. If you're in Switzerland, you're not going to get 6% for a fixed deposit for 12 months. You'll be lucky to get 5.3. All right. If you're in Israel for six months, you can get 6% for a fixed deposit. So the client says, well, why should I buy that JP Morgan bond giving me five point something when I can get a fixed deposit? close my eyes, no headache, no ups or downs, and very simple. And um, the answer to that is 
the fixed deposit is for one year. When that fixed deposit renews in a year's time, you're not sure what the rate's going to be. It might be higher, might be lower. Uh, we think it's going to be lower as things calm down, as the inflation comes down. I'll talk about that. We think interest rates are going to come down slowly uh, through 2024 and 2025. So we think that fixed deposits will renew at lower and lower rates going forward. Whereas if you buy that bond portfolio, and I'm not talking about one bond, I'm talking about a whole bunch of portfolios that can give you, uh, you know, in the half five percent, you can lock in that maturity till 2026, and you've locked in 5.8 now for four years. Whereas the six percent, which the bank is offering you now, if you're lucky enough to get it, um, then uh, it, it, it's just for one year. You don't know what's going to happen thereafter. So that's fixed deposit versus bond portfolio. Okay, uh, now focusing on equities and um, I'm gonna be moving now a little bit more forward thinking. We believe the uh, worst is behind us. As I say, equities are forward looking. This talk of a recession, the impact of high interest rates, these are all known by the market. Uh, uh, all the bad news that is known is, is, is priced in. And the interest rate path is known Ukraine is known, uh, uh, so it's only the negative surprises that we don't know about um, could be um, could be for, you know could have furtherly could affect us further this year. Uh, as I said, simple stats say positive year follow negative year. That gives us a source of comfort. The economic picture in the first half of 2023, you can expect to weaken. OK, expect to read those newspaper articles, which are a little bit sensationalist and a little bit scary that, you know, things are getting worse. Expect that. OK, we expect the economic picture to weaken through the first half of 2023. The second half of 2024, of 2023 and 2024 is, is obviously extremely difficult to predict, but we're kind of more optimistic uh, if interest rates stabilize, et cetera, then and inflation comes down, then we're a bit more optimistic about the economic picture. But again, the uh, equities are forward, look, are forward uh, thinking and the markets will bottom long before the sentiment turns positive, okay? And I think that's very important. We may actually have seen the bottom of the market for this, for this cycle. Um, it's, it's difficult to say, but we may have actually seen it. Uh, because always the market's bottom before the good news really starts flowing in. Um, okay, equity link structure notes for clients who are still concerned, uh, and we are doing it. We like index link structure notes. I've spoken about it a lot in the past, and I still believe that those are a good place to add value. Okay, so looking at 2023, um, we have to ask, are the issues that hurt us in 2022, are they over? Are they behind us? And uh, so Ukraine, it's a known. I think that it's, it's a stuck in a stalemate. I cannot see any resolution for Ukraine. On the other hand, I can't see an escalation. I don't think Putin will use uh, nuclear weapons. I don't think that uh, Ukraine will make significant attacks on, uh, on Russia. Um, so it's just gonna be contained there. The impact will be more in Europe than in the USA, but at least it's a known. Inflation, I'm gonna talk, I've got a little bit of a slide, uh, I'm gonna talk about it a bit more detail, but we think it's coming down, we think inflation has been. Central bank policy surprise. Will there be another central bank policy surprise? Difficult to say because we don't trust what the Federal Reserve are actually telling the market anymore. And um, we don't think so. So what a surprise which would hurt us is another spike in interest rate. We really don't think that's going to happen because we're already hitting the ceiling of what it, where interest rates could be. Uh, China zero COVID policy, which was a concern going into 2022. Already China is starting to open up. They recognize that, that was a mistake. They'll never say so. We'll never know the truth about COVID in China, but um, at least China's zero COVID um, tolerance where they would shut down uh, 
for COVID reasons, shut down the economy and, and therefore affect global supply chains, we think that that's behind us as well. Are there new factors in 2023? Is there something so that we discuss the issue of a recession, assume that there'll be a mild recession of some sort, assume it'll be worse in Europe than in the USA. Property, we could see some real pain coming in the property sector. Already property prices in the States are down 20, 30%. Uh, depending on the area. Um, so yes, property, we, we might see some, some deals in trouble in the property space. Um, new geopolitical risks. So I don't think there's anything new, right? Iran is a real risk, especially for us sitting here in Israel. I think that Iran is looking at Ukraine and saying, hmm, let's uh, push ahead with our nuclear um, uh, uh, abilities as fast as possible. So Iran is a, is a real issue. I don't believe the um, China is going to attack Taiwan. I really don't believe that's going to happen. Um, that would be a, a big deal if it does happen, but I don't believe it's going to happen. Uh, and then who knows what else will be thrown at us geopolitically. Normally, geopolitically, you can ignore from an investment point of view. Normally. I'll qualify that a little bit. Okay. So inflation. Now, remember with inflation, in, in order for inflation to remain high, prices have to constantly rise. If, you, if something cost $100 last year and it's now 110, inflation is 10%. But in, in order for inflation to remain at 10%, that product has to cost 120 next year. I know that that sounds very trivial, but people forget that inflation, has, you, it's not just that prices went up and they're now expensive. They have to constantly keep going up. And that's what the, the Fed is going to try to control. So we've already seen prices slow down their increase. Um, signs that the inflation has peaked. Commodity prices have come down. They're a bit more stable. There was a lot of talk about, uh, you know, what sort of winter would Europe have? I don't think that, I never believed that that was an issue this year because oil is not bought today for tomorrow. It's normally bought on futures contracts six, 12 months into the future. So perhaps next year's winter is more relevant than this year's winter. But we've seen prices stabilize and the war is continuing. So I don't think oil is going to contribute much to inflation going forward. And then the post-COVID demand and supply issues, they seem to be resolving themselves. They seem to be opening up. So those are signs that inflation has, has slowed or stopped. And um, in signs that inflation is going to remain high, there's a psychological side to inflation where people anticipate their costs going up or they anticipate uh, other competitors increasing prices and they're anticipating price increase. So they increase inflation, they increase their uh, prices purely based on anticipated price increases that may or may not materialize. So that is quite hard to stop, that, that uh, or he's increasing prices, so I must also increase my prices. That's quite hard to stop. Um, and, and the economy really needs to slow down for that to take effect. There's, um, when I mentioned earlier about the 3.7% unemployment, with uh, low unemployment, um, there might be wage pressure, and that would contribute towards inflation. Housing, U.S. housing um, had a big boost over the COVID period, like 30 to 40% increase. Owners of property across the U.S., including multifamily, want to pass on those higher prices that they paid for their investment. They want to pass that on to tenants now. And um, so we expect to see rises in rentals, but I'm not sure it's going to be sustained. and uh, it depends on how much pressure uh, and what's available, et cetera. So the, that would be a, an argument for inflation to remain high. Conclusion, I believe inflation has peaked, but it will come down slowly. It will not happen in one quarter. It might take a year and a half for inflation to come down to where it should be. My crystal ball, uh, some of these points I touched on, no end in sight for Ukraine. The global economy will be slow. Uh, but will not crash. Um, there will not be a Great Depression of any kind, I don't think. Uh, US will be slower, but very resilient. 
Europe will feel it more. Um, it's in terms of emerging markets, this is a big debate in my team, whether we're ready to allocate money to the emerging market. Within the emerging market, we think you know, China, India is probably the place to be. Um, I believe inflation will be low, I said that. And we think that rates will, towards the end of this year, perhaps next year, rates will start coming down. And central banks, I think, have learned a little bit of a lesson from 2022, and they shouldn't surprise us uh, this year. Okay, property and private debt. Um, so as I said, I expect some property pain here and there. Israel seems more resilient. I haven't seen prices come down. I have seen more signs about uh, apartments for rent, apartments for sale. So maybe there's less deals going on, but uh, I haven't heard of prices coming down yet. Um, I expect within the world of alternatives, um, there's a lot of lending funds. And now these are illiquid underlying assets. And if too many people pull out of these uh, alternative funds, you might find that they gate. The largest fund in the world is called Blackstone um, a REIT. It's a, re a real estate investment trust fund, uh, unlisted REIT fund, and it is already gated. It's the largest in the world. It's, it's some huge number, and investors cannot get out even if they want to. It doesn't mean that they're going to lose money. It just means that they, the investment which had semi-liquidity has now got no liquidity. Okay. Alternative funds were the heroes of 2022. They and they they've made a lot of them were in positive territory. Some of them very positive, um, which is very very different from the liquid markets. And um, some of these will be under pressure to beat those bond and fixed deposit rates that uh, we talked about earlier. So that five six percent range. Some of these funds will struggle to to beat them. Some of them will be okay. Uh, but so, especially on the basis that the recession is light, et cetera, then uh, I think that those will be okay. There are certain hedge fund strategies that I like, uh, and um, maybe if you're invested in one or two lending funds, maybe it's time to consider uh, moving to uh, some hedge funds. Okay, so um, let's cover some of the uh, questions received on registration. Is it a good time to buy a shekel? Currency is extremely difficult to, uh, to guess. There's one correlation which is uh, very reliable, and that is as the stock market recovers, we expect the shekel to recover. As the, she as the US stock market goes down, we expect the shekel to weaken. That's quite a reliable correlation. So on the basis that 2023, the stock market will do okay, then we expect the shekel to strengthen through 2023. Um, I, it, but that's a macro view, it could be completely wrong. And uh, all I can say is that the today's rate, which I think is 347, um, is a rate which people at 310 would have dreamed about. So think about it in that context. Um, interesting question, why was not more research done into the, the Ukraine-Russian war potential consequences with so much warning. Well, there we knew last December that uh, Putin was building up troop um, uh, positions on the border. That was known. Uh, and it was pretty much accepted that he would do something. But that something was considered to be only the Donetsk and the uh, eastern parts of Ukraine. Nobody thought at least the probability that he would bomb Kiev was, um, was regarded as, as remote because no one could see what he could possibly gain by bombing the hell out of uh, Kiev, which is an up and coming uh, you know, town with, with so much potential. And um, uh, so I don't think it was known, um, the Ukraine position. The uh, him attacking the eastern part is the same as what he did in 2014 with Crimea. Crimea. So we thought that that would be the case. Um, it was by no means a known uh, a known issue. Uh, should I pull my money now? Uh, probably not. Probably not. As I said, if you held it and your bonds have come down, you want to hold those bonds to maturity. You don't want to sell them and buy other bonds. You want to hold those bonds to maturity. Obviously, it depends what, what bonds you're holding. But um, And then on the stock side, it's never a good time to, to, to try to time the market. 
but that's a very client specific uh, question. Perspectives on the new government regarding tax in Israel. Um, I don't believe we're going to see a major change in the tax regime here. Um, I have been told that we might expect some sort of exit tax. <clears throat> so, for example, if you're living in Israel and you go live in Powell Alto because you've got, you know, a whole lot of high tech options, then um, currently, if you leave Israel, there's no exit tax. And the talk of the town is there will be an exit tax. I don't believe there'll be estate tax or donations tax or gift tax or any of those capital taxes. I don't believe we'll see any of those. Um, the, uh, the, the tax on the high earners is already very high. Um, and there's the 3% wealth tax in Israel. So I, it's hard to imagine they'll put more, uh, more taxes there. Um, I just hope that they don't increase that to 18%. But so overall, I'm not expecting any major tax changes. Um, the uh, on that subject, the strategically, Israel's going to earn less. You know, they earn on cars and on petrol uh, and um, and electric cars have got an incentive. So more and more people are buying electric cars. So that. That's a source of revenue that needs to be replaced on the government's point of view, but uh, I don't expect any major changes. <clears throat> as the outlook for bond returns improved, what is your current view of alternatives as part of the portfolio? Alternatives belong. They belong before we had low interest rates, they belong during low interest rates, and they belong after. Prim the primary advantage of alternatives is the low correlation with the liquid market. So if you've got alternatives in your portfolio, then on a portfolio view, you've reduced your overall portfolio risk, okay? When bond returns were super low, then it made sense to have more alternatives, okay? If you could handle the relative complexity of alternatives, the limited liquidity, et cetera. So, um, uh, that, but they still belong, okay? There's a lot of research on this. You can uh, see how the large, um, endowment funds in the US, whether it's Yale or Harvard or any of them, you can see that their weighting to alternatives was exceptionally high in the low interest rate environment, and I believe it will remain high uh, uh, going forward. So yes, alternatives belong. Um, with the rise in Israeli interest rates, will, the, what, will we have an effect on Israeli bonds and bond funds that Pioneer invests in? I think most of that is behind us. Um, Interest rates in Israel, these short-term interest rates, will probably go up, will touch around the 4%. It's debatable whether it will go above 4 but a lot of that is already behind us. So uh, I don't think we're going to see a major surprise in 2023. Where do I see the shekel in six months? I think I touched on that in the earlier question. Um, how do interest rates affect the economy? This is, you could do a whole degree on this question. Uh, basically, the more money you're spending on interest, the less money you're spending on other things. Um, and the there's some companies and uh, that are heavily levered; they got a lot of debt. So, uh, uh, very simply, higher interest rates hurt the economy and um, uh, will slow down the economy. Gilts or equities? So, gilts are UK government bonds um, or equities. So this is obviously coming from someone who has a sterling portfolio. I would not be buying uh, uh, gilts right now. Uh, the UK, I think the UK um, is going to have a, a bigger problem controlling uh, inflation than the US did. Um, and uh, I'm, a little bit, I'm a little bit worried about the UK. So I would not be buying UK government bonds, particularly long ones. You can buy a one-year one uh, gilt if you, uh, if you can. Uh, so I prefer, if you've got the stomach for it, I prefer uh, equities on gilts. But it's, that, that, it's a very much a, a risk-based a risk question. Um, how is this recession different from previous? I think I kind of uh, touched on that a little bit. And the upswing in the market, uh, I'm not sure exactly if this refers to the bond or the, the stock market, but the bond market sooner, stock market perhaps later. Real estate trends in Israel and globally, I think I touched on that. Um, lots of, uh, there is lots of pain in the uh, real estate world right now, particularly people who, if you bought something in 2021, 
then it might be a while before you see that deal above water. Um, okay, just to wrap it up, uh, we're in 50 minutes. Uh, all investors had a major setback to their portfolios in 22, regardless who your asset manager was. It's very important for me to stress that. Don't sell now, especially your bonds. Classic behavioral finance mistake is to sell after a loss. Um, 2020 should be better. We don't expect another rate, high, uh, rate spike. We like investment grade bonds, two to three, max four years in length, giving us five to 6% return, high quality names. That's what we believe is recession proof investing. Equities have faith in the long-term assumptions of the market. You should be fine. And that is all. I will try now address some of the questions that came in. Hold on a second. Uh, Okay, no, not many questions. Let's have a quick look. Uh, no, I think I addressed all of that. Okay, so I hope this uh, webinar was uh, interesting and uh, we look forward to seeing you in uh, our April, early April webinar. So thank you very much for the time. Hope you enjoyed.